Hey, welcome to another edition of 15 Minutes of Flame. Today is the 13th of December. We are at 12, 13, 16, counting down towards the end of the year. And we are only six days away from when the Electoral College meets. And theoretically, uh, votes and uh, stamps Donald J. Trump into office, although that is not a given at this point in time, as the electors are asking to be briefed now on the CIA's findings that the election was hacked. I have a theory about this. It has no basis in any kind of grounding or any kind of data or any kind of evidence implied or otherwise that I believe that there have been electors that have been placed inside of the Electoral College for this exact event to occur, that these are not dyed-in-the-wool Republicans. And if they are, they are Republicans in the sense that they are willing, or at least their electors willing, to kowtow and conform to the old school Republican agenda, or they are Manchurian candidates in and of themselves, ready to rebel, placed in those positions specifically for this moment in time. And I think it would be interesting to do background checks. Now, here's where the citizen journalists need to get involved. They need to figure out who these electors are. So if you are a citizen journalist, or a citizen investigator, and you have ample time and ample tools at your disclosure, let's find out who these electors are. Let's find out how they got there. Let's find out what their allegiances are, what their alliances are, and let's blow them out. Let's expose them, because if we're having a truly transparent debate or discussion around the electoral process, and again, I don't care if you're for Trump or against Trump. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about hacking, not the election itself, but the process and the system of the election. Now, some of you may follow me on uh, Gaia slash Gaia with Regina. And um, the last time I was on there, I talked about this exact scenario happening. What did we see after the election? We saw an uptick in the riots, the protests. They've kind of died down a little bit. It's getting colder out there. It's not as easy to hang out for four or five hours and protest hard unless you're on some pretty good drugs, maybe a cocktail of alcohol, methamphetamine, but you can't keep that up for very long, maybe a couple days, and then you're wasted and wiped out. And you're of no use to the party. So we've had that. Now, the election was theoretically not close enough. And we keep hearing, well, Hillary won the popular vote. Hillary won the popular vote. Hillary Hillary probably won the popular vote in places like California and Nevada, which helped tilt the election. Oregon, quite possibly Washington State, New Mexico, because there was an influx of illegal immigrants. Yes, illegal. I'm sorry, I'm using the term. It's politically incorrect, but it's true because there are people that go through a legal process of being here. And what I mean by that is they have to apply. They have to apply, they have to go through, they have to get vetted. Now, I remember a long time ago, I was living in California and I was managing this apartment building. And uh, the guy who... Um, lived below me was from um, Africa and he uh, was really engaged in the legal process of becoming a U.S. citizen. Wonderful guy. He was a Muslim. He was a wonderful man. And I actually did readings for him. I did readings for him and his daughter and he would feed me with uh, peanut curry chicken and rice and very strong black tea with, with spearmints in it. It's a great guy. Legal. 
So there's a legal process, and then there's another process that is obviously, you know, rushing and flooding the gates. Um, so, yeah, I'm using a term that is politically incorrect, but because I'm using it, it implies that there is another part of that process. But this is what happened with California. Uh, and likely happened in Nevada, New Mexico, and maybe perhaps Oregon, Washington. And this is how Hillary theoretically won a popular vote. Now, let's quell the subject that something went awry in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, because all three of those recounts are closed. Trump wins in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. They are certified. Okay. So Jill Stein, thank you so much for your persistence on being a good American and making sure that the electoral process was fair and just, because we know that these things can be tampered with and hacked and they have been in the past. To that extent, you were right, Joel Stein. But now we can close this chapter and we can move on. The playbook, the playbook was supposed to go like this. It was supposed to be so close, so close, that there would have to be some suspension of the process, the electoral, the constitutional process, combined with the fanning of the flames of dissent through Black Lives Matter, and all the other socially, social justice warrior groups who are just really a front for the Communist Party. And again, it may be politically incorrect. I may sound like a crazy guy from the 1950s, that there's one hiding under every bed. The red scare, the red dread. But hey, it is true, boys and girls. Never went away. It was a trick. Brought to you, ironically by the same lawyer who represented Donald Trump in his case against the NFL, that would be Roy Cohn. Now, we have clearly demonstrated and illustrated that he won the popular, he won the electoral college, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. We can shut that down. They're trying to create a feeling of mistrust and unrest based upon the Russians hacking and impeding the election process. What does that mean? Just define it. What does it really mean? Did the Russians go in and tamper with the voting machines? Did the Russians uh, orchestrate WikiLeaks? No, they did not. And if you ask for proof from any of these talking heads, they can't give it to you. What they'll talk about is they'll talk about some secret information, sources which cannot be named, and you're going to run a real election based on sources. This is major stuff. This is serious stuff. You've got to come forward with your sources. The sources must come forward, and when they do, they should be countered by the FBI and the NSA and any other group inside the government which has clear, and the NSA has clear, the NSA knows where everything is spilling out of. The NSA is grabbing what I'm saying right now. You know, what we have is a rogue group inside the government, inside the CA, that does not want this election to stand, to take place, and they want to use this as a form of chaos, possibly restarting and having another election whether it's by the electors who've been inserted. I'm telling you right now, they've been inserted into the Electoral College. That's number one. Or number two, raising the suspicion of doubt that the Russians somehow interfered with the process. And we're going to have to have another election. And it may happen after the first of the year. But I'm going to tell you right now, if that occurs, we're going to have riots on the streets of America. It's going to happen. And when that happens, you're going to see troops. And the troops that you see may not even be American troops. They can be embedded in places like Denver, Phoenix, Albuquerque, Chicago, 
wherever they are. And they may show up in American uniforms, or they may show up in UN uniforms, but I guarantee you they're not going to be from this country. And what we'll be dealing with is what's called continuity of government. It won't be martial law. And we'll be in this state, this, this, this purgatory, this political purgatory. And it's not going to be pretty because it will erupt into a civil war. We cannot have this. And I, look, I, 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 Donald Trump having dinner with Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger is lauding Trump. He's unprecedented. He has an unprecedented vision of a new world order. I mean, Trump could be our worst enemy. He could be our worst nightmare. Absolutely. And I said, you cannot trust Donald Trump. And even Henry Kissinger, on the heels of that meeting and that dinner, cannot trust Donald Trump. If he thinks he can, he is sorely mistaken. I have given the astrological data and evidence ad nauseum again and again and again. Sun conjunct Uranus, Gemini, true, no, 10th house. Changeable, mutable, disruptive. This is where we are. And it's important that we pay very close attention because what they are trying to do is they are trying to create a coup. This is the same scenario I talked about when I was on Gaian, but they had to get here a little bit differently. They went through this, they went through this, they went through, oh, here we are now. It's the Russians. The Russians did it. Well, they are using the Russian meme, but they're also bringing another meme. And this one is, I, for me, it is dangerous and it is disingenuous. If you look at the other color revolutions, and we are in a color revolution. I just saw an interview with Katie Couric and Edward Stone. By the way, I'm going to create a blasphemy here. Edward Snowden, your 15 minutes are up. I don't give a shit about what you say. You're no, you're no longer relevant. And to be honest with you, you weren't that relevant to me when you, you know, supposedly took all of that evidence, all that information that you were able to kludge and put on hard drives and take out of the NSA as a contractor from Booz Allen. You go all the way across the world go to Hong Kong with a film crew, very conspicuous, by the way. Look, if they wanted to take out Edward Snowden, they could take him out in a freaking heartbeat. They could particle beam weapon him. They could heart attack him. There's so many ways they could take Edward Snowden out. Trust me. They knew exactly where he was. They knew what he was doing. What Edward Snowden was doing was basically telling you what people on the who've been paying attention since the 90s have already known that the NSA has overstepped its boundaries we knew back in 2000 that the NSA was had servers inside of places like Verizon or AT&T and they were they were tapping in directly from the servers we knew that was taking place. As soon as 9-11 happened, it was over, boys and girls. Edward Snowden wasn't telling me or anybody else who really studied this stuff anything new. Go back to the 90s. Get into the Promise software. Danny Casolaro. The Promise software, Echelon, Project Echelon. That, that was the software. That was the database that was that was that was the the, the 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 technology that the NSA basically stole was using to grab every single keyword from the internet. That's what that's what it was. And basically, what they did was after 9/11, they were given carte blanche to use Promise. Now, what they have is way more sophisticated than Promise ever was. It's Promise 3.0 or 4.0 at this point. So Edward Snowden's confessions, Edward Snowden's 
you know, blows against the empire were really not all that special, to be honest with you. And now Katie Couric has flown to Russia in order to, you know, have an interview with the very thoughtful um, Edward Snowden. Because I really think that if people really paid attention, that they could find that the intelligence community is still very much in operation. And I think what's really important is that there is some form of real disclosure, some form of real transparency, so that people can make up their, their own minds. Who, who doesn't think that? Just because you're a nerd, you wear glasses, and, you, and, and you're thoughtful, and you somehow have street cred because you're hanging out in Russia? And by the way, Katie Cork is wearing purple when she was doing this. Here's what's really dangerous. You see, in the other color revolutions, it wasn't about pity people against one another. It was pitting people against a regime or a dictator that they had painted to be corrupt. Or in some cases, like with Mubarak, they just cut off the food. They just stopped having bread available to people. When people get hungry, they get pissed off, and they want change. Because they want to feed their bellies, they want to make sure their wife gets fed, their kid gets fed. Really basic primary, down, 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 Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But that's not what they're doing here. No, in order for you to understand the dangerous, disingenuous depths that they are delving into. You have to go to South Africa. You have to go to the apartheid regime of South Africa. That's essentially what they're doing now. They are turning the United States ideologically and psychically into an apartheid state. And it is not anywhere near or close to that. Because they have been beating this drum again and again and again and again and again through Black Lives Matters and some of these shootings, many of which are staged, by the way, many of which are staged, and I've talked about this both on the white and the black side of the ledger sheets, both on the cop side and on the criminal side. They've been staged. Some of them are real. Some of them are not real. But they've been staged for your consumption. And what they are doing over the course of the last three years, four, really since the death of Trayvon Martin, is that they have turned white America into South Africa and the apartheid state. They have turned Donald Trump into Hitler. And this is what they are trying to do. They are trying to rewire the minds of Americans. They are trying to create a color revolution that's based on race because this is the weapon that they have at their disposal. This is the divide and conquer neutron bomb. And I don't care what color you are, but you should be angry about this because you're being manipulated. Doesn't matter what side of the color line you're on. You're being manipulated. If you're on the white side of the color line, you're being manipulated through your guilt. Oh my, I have too much. I have too much. I have such privilege. Please take a baseball bat to my head. And please take all my money, take my wife, take my cat, take my kids. I have too much. That's completely disingenuous. On the other hand, if you have any kind of latent racism, it, this will certainly add some kerosene to it. That's manipulative as well. Does it get to come out? Sure, it gets to come out and wash. Does it need to? Yeah, it likely needs to. Let's get it all out on the table. Why not? Right? 
but it's still manipulative. What would be better? What would be a better way? Promoting real equality, not at the expense of one group or one race or one class or the other. We all rise together. Whatever happened to that motto? I mean, that's kind of what Trump is doing with Make America Great Again, because that was the model. But we all rise together. If anybody ever like nailed that platform, man, we all rise together. Who, who wouldn't get behind that? You know, unless you are so just stubbornly selfish, stubbornly selfish. Like, I'm going to get mine and screw you and screw everybody else. Because if it means me getting mine and you not getting yours, in fact, I get to take away from yours, then I'm going to get mine no matter what. If we have that situation on this planet and on this con- in this country, we're a part of my language, we're fucked. We're screwed. We're done. We may as well just have encampments at that point. And that's just the way it is. If you're on the other side of the ledger, uh, ledger sheet, if you're on the other side of the color ledger sheet, your anger is being exploited. And your goodwill, your sense of being able to live together and co-create together, that's being exploited. That capital is being spent at the expense of short-term gain, immediate gratification. Now, if that's where your head is, and that's where your heart is, and that's where your solar plexus is, then so be it. I'm just here to tell you that what's happening is exploitative across the board. You know, I saw a picture the other day. It's come up two times in the last 24 hours. It's a picture of Bill Clinton, George Bush, and George Wallace all hanging out together with, at that time, George Wallace's third wife, I think. And there couldn't have been a more racist governor than George Wallace. I mean, that guy was racist. And they're comparing Donald Trump to George Wallace. And yet, and yet, there's Bill Clinton hanging out with George Bush and George Wallace, the two Georges, getting into that Gemini thing. Uh, it's amazing. And by the way, the last time I checked, you know, George Wallace died a Democrat. He was not a Republican. He was a Democrat. And this is the guy that said, you're not going to have anybody uh, except a white students show up at the University of Alabama. Took Kennedy to break through that line. Hey, we're sending down, we are sending down federal troops so these people can go to school here. Not a bad deal. That was George Wallace. And they're comparing Donald Trump to George Wallace. You show me anywhere, anywhere in Donald Trump's history where he was even remotely close to anything like that. Donald Trump has been a champion for women in the workplace. His company is staffed and stocked with competent women, quote unquote minorities. Were there any problems uh, inside of his company with quote unquote minorities working for him? Don't you think it would have come out by this point, at this point in time? No, it hasn't. And again, Trump could be terrible. I mean, he's having coffee and tea and rubbing shoulders with um, Henry Kissinger. Next week, he's going to go hang out with Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates to talk about new energy and global warming and all those things that those guys are so desperately invested in. Ivanka Trump hung out with Al Gore. She brought Al Gore to Trump Tower. If you're a liberal and you're and you've got you know some kind of ideological or environmental investment in this global warming trip, don't you think that that's actually kind of a, a positive that he's having these dialogues with people, people that are invested in that model? I'm just here to do my best to keep handing you a nice strong cup of coffee. This is what I'm here to do. 
15, now 30 minutes a day. I'm doing this 30 minutes a day now because it allows me to get more ideas out. You can spend 30 minutes your day listening to some of the, uh, the ideas and what I'm sharing with you. What is the antidote? We got to be kinder. We must be kinder with one another. That is the challenge. That is the trick. Look, nobody says that you have to open a door for somebody. You don't have to do it. Whether it's a man or a woman, child, or whatever ethnicity they might be, you don't have to do that. Nobody says you have to do that. Nobody says that you have to be politically correct and mix or do whatever you need to do in order to feel good. No, you don't have to. See, we live in a place where if you want to live a separate life, you can, believe it or not. At the end of the day, is it going to make the place better? My answer to that is no. Because I think we do need to build bridges. I think we do need to be able to connect with one another, to open doors for one another, to be able to look one another in the eye, to greet each other as we walk down the street. I think it's important. The small things, the Gemini moments of the day, make up the big picture of the place that we live in and who we are and how we can be kinder and more compassionate with other people. But if that kindness and if that compassion is spurned again and again and again, then you're wasting your time. And at that point, you have a responsibility to move on and put your energy into people and areas and other places that are receptive to it. And only you know who that is or what that is as it relates to your life. Cast not pearls before One of the maxims that uh, the big guy talked about. Anyway, that's today's 15, now 30 minutes of flame. I'm Robert Phoenix. My back is feeling so much better today. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with another 15 minutes. Uh, Until then, have a great day.